This morning I want to minister on the power of obedience. The power of obedience. Deuteronomy 30 verse 14 through 20. When you have it, say amen. The word of God says, But the word is very near you, in your mouth and in your heart, that you may do it. And I have set before you today life and good, death and evil, in that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments, his statutes and his judgments, that you may live and multiply. And the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you go to possess. But if your heart turns away so that you do not hear and are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I announce to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not prolong your days in the land which, the, which you cross over the Jordan to go possess. I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live and that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice and that you may cling to him. For he is your life and the length of your days. And you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you today, Lord, on this beautiful day, Lord God, to acknowledge that you are our Lord and Savior, Savior Lord God, that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Today, Father, we come together as your church, Father God, to serve you. We come today to worship you, Lord, in spirit and in truth, to lift up your mighty name, Lord God. For we know, Lord God, that you are our Redeemer the rock of our salvation. You are our peace and our provision. It is in you, Lord God, that we have our hope, that our strength is found in you. You are our refuge, Lord, and our peace. We thank you today, Lord God. We thank you for the life that we have in your son, Jesus, Lord, that by his obedience, Lord God, that, uh, that, that by his obedience, by giving his life on that cross, Lord God, that we can have eternal life, Lord. We thank you today, Lord. We thank you that we are new creations in you, Lord. We thank you today, Father, and we ask, Lord God, that as your word goes forth, that it would go forth under the anointing of your Holy Spirit, that our hearts would be open today, Lord God, that this word would land upon good soil, Father, that we would examine ourselves in light of your word, Father, and if there be any sin in us, Lord God, if there be any disobedience in us, if there be anything that is not glorifying in us, Lord, that we would see it and that we would, Lord God, in obedience, Lord God, lay it down before your feet. Lord, we desire to be made in the image of your Son, to reflect him clearly, Lord. Help us, Lord God, in those areas where we struggle. Help us, Lord God, in those areas, Father, where we hold out in rebellion to you. Father, out of fear, out of unbelief, out of doubt. Lord, we renounce that today, Lord God, and we lay our hearts open that you would be enthroned in our hearts and in our church and in all that we do, Lord, that we would build your kingdom in this generation, Lord, that we would build your kingdom, Lord. We lay ourselves down as living sacrifices, as living stones, Lord. We set ourselves down before the master builder, and we let you, Lord God, do as you will today, Father. We give you all the honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So we, as we read Deuteronomy, we see this awesome promise that God has made to the children of Israel, that he would guarantee an outcome of the nation that, would possess, that they would possess the land, and that they would enjoy the blessing of God, not only for their lives, but also for their children and their children's children. Now, I don't know about you, but as I get older and as I've had children, I start to recognize that it's no longer about me. I want to leave a legacy for my son, for my daughter. I want to leave a legacy. And the Lord here, he says that if you do, if you're obedient, if you follow my commands, if you do as I called you to do, and you don't serve other gods, that I will take care of that. The Bible says that seek ye first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all those things will be added unto you. And all those things are the desires of our heart. God knows that we have desires. Amen? God knows. It's not evil to have a desire in your heart. It's not evil to want to want to, sec to have security for your family's future. It's not evil to want to to want things that your family can enjoy. It's not evil to want to have uh, somebody to share your life with. These are not evil things. Sometimes as believers, we act like the desires of our heart. He says, but he says, seek ye first the kingdom. And if we seek ye first God's will for us, the Bible says that he who seeks to save his life will lose it. But he who loses his life for my sake shall find it. And this is the truth of God's word. Here God has made this promise to the children of Israel. He said, I'm going to give you this land of everywhere that your foot hits, you will possess. And, and, and the promises even grace is, but I call heaven and earth as a witness against you today. That if you do not obey, that this promise has, it has conditions in a sense. And the conditions are that we obey God. 
And so it's simple. You know, the requirement was to obey God, he told them. And it's simple for the mind to understand and agree with, but it's tricky when you try to apply it to your life. Amen? There's a lot of things in life that are simple to understand. Right? If you take a basketball, you go, yeah, all you got to do is jump, slam it in. That's simple. Give me a basketball. It's not that easy to apply in my life. Amen? Because I have certain limitations. I have certain things that, don't, that, 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 that cause me to struggle in that. So the commandment is simple, to be obedient to God. But in the application, we, that's where we find it to be tricky. See, the heavy lifting God would take care of. They were only required to remain in a position of obedience to receive all that he had for them. To do so to them would be life, not only for them, but for their children and their children's children. But to disobey would be certain death and cursing. See, the promises of God are great, but the consequences are equally as great. With as much as we go through, and in, in, in people go, I'm going through so many changes, I'm going through so many, so many trials. Yes, because in direct proportion to your trials is the blessings. So as you're able to be obedient, God is establishing your character in order to possess the promises and blessings that he has for you. And see, what we have to understand is that this generation, we've swallowed the lies of the enemy that the power of God is in knowing and agreeing with the gospel message and that obedience to the gospel message is, a, is an option. It's not an option, amen? These conditions are predicated on our obedience. Everything that the Word of God has in it, everything that we read here is available to us. It doesn't have to be compromised. It doesn't have to be uh, compromised in order for us to, you know, Abraham, when he went with, with, um, with uh, Sarah, with Abraham, when he went with her maidservant, it was like a compromise to fulfill the promises. We don't have to do that. If we remain true to the promises of God and to the Word of God, then God will fulfill His end. And we have an, a generation that thinks that if I agree with it, if I understand it in my, in my mind, if I understand it and I can explain it doctrinally or the way that it's taught, that that's enough. But in reality, that's not enough. See, there's an overload of information, but very little revelation. Information can be consumed, it can be memorized, it can be studied, but revelation can only come through the willful submitting yourself under the doctrine you claim to believe. And what I mean by that is you submit yourself under that teaching. I'm not saying my teaching, I'm saying the teaching of the Word. It's good to know the Word of God. It's good to study the Word of God. It's, it's necessary in order to really understand. But more than under, don't try to learn more than you're willing to apply. Some people, I've known Christians that, man, they'll, they could quote Scripture backwards and forwards, but they can't live out the simplest truth. They can't forgive. They can't love their, they can't love they're enemies. They can't do the simple things, but yet they know all the Greek and the Hebrew. They know how, how it relates to this and that. But yet in the simple things, they find it difficult to apply. See, the conviction of the Holy Spirit is not the end result of God's desire. Sometimes we think when we come to church that when the pastor preaches and, the, and when the worship plays, that that feeling of conviction and when the message, message comes out and that feeling of conviction and we go to the altar and we get up, that, that right there we are in agreement with God. But reality, that's, they, those emotions draw us towards an action. But if we don't act on those convictions, it doesn't matter. It's of no effect. That's why motivation, it's great. You know, the worship plays, the songs that we sing are songs of praise and worship, and they cause our spirits to be stirred. Because sometimes we don't have the words. You know, when it, what was that song you guys were just saying? It was um, um, the Holy... The, um, yeah, help me out here. Take me into the Holy of Holies. Take me in by the blood of the Lamb. Take me into the... Man, when you sing that song, man, I'm just like, man, all of those words just... They cause my spirit to rejoice. It's like even if the inner man is asleep... Because he stayed up late, the inner man just hears those words. It's like, it's like uh, you know when you're asleep and somebody's making some bomb breakfast. You know, you're just, that aroma wakes you up. Your flesh doesn't want to get up. It doesn't want to get up, but man, you just are so hungry, you get up. It, could, it can bring you up, and that's what worship can do. It can, rout, it can raise your spirit from a slumber. And those feelings, man, they can be like an amazing, once you start hearing, I, I enter in by the blood of the Lamb, like, man, I can come into the holiest of holies, and I know that I can come in not because I'm good, or because, but by the blood of the Lamb, like, man, that stirs me up, but that stirring up is just a precursor to an active life of obedience and faith. And if we don't have that, then we're robbing ourselves. See, the devil's not scared that you're here this morning. He's not worried that you agree with the message, that you say amen, that you leave here stirred up. He would love for you to make an altar call this morning as long as you don't act on the convictions that God places in your heart tomorrow. 
He loves that. He loves Christians who will uh, just, uh, they're just on, uh, ooh, the altar, they leave every facial fluid, they leave at the altar, their tears, their mocos, their boogers, they leave it all there. They get up, they feel, oh, I just felt like I took a spiritual shower. As long as you leave all of that here, then he doesn't, he loves that. He's, he's right there in the parking lot around now saying, yes, yes, get it. As long as you leave it here and you don't take it with you, then you're of no real threat to me. And that's how he feels. See, we have to learn that it's in obedience. James 1.22, he says, be doers of the word and not hearers, only deceiving yourself. We can deceive ourselves by being hearers, by saying, amen, amen, preacher, preacher, do that. Or when we read the word of God, it's like looking in a mirror. When we look into a mirror, we don't look into a mirror just to see where we're at, but we look. I go at, I do one of those because sometimes I got, you know, some ornaments in my nose. You know what I mean? I want to get those out, even though I'm short, but still somebody might see them. I, I want to look if my eyebrows are out of place, you know? If I got something in my teeth, I look into the mirror so that I can correct myself, so that I can present myself the best that I can. And so when we look into the mirror of God's word, it's not just to amen, it's not to approve, it's to, to verify, to make sure. You know, in the, when, we, when I was in the Marine Corps, they used to say, they used to have mirrors placed so you could look at your uniform and they would say, if somebody accused you of being a Marine, would there be enough evidence to, uh, to convict you? What they were saying is like, is, are you, do you look like it? You know, because they were, you, they were very strict. If you were driving in a car and you didn't have your hat on, I could be driving a car without my hat on and from down the street you could hear, put your cover on, Marine. They would check you and it didn't matter on the slightest things, they would check you. You know, I would be out one time, remember I was out in my dress blues, and we were out like, uh, uh, there was a Marine Corps ball, and afterwards, you know, everybody's sloppy, and, and if some Marine caught you on the street, and you, you were out, your uniform was looked all sloppy, they would, they would get on you. And you and I, that's what the Word of God does, it's to correct us, it's to instruct us in righteousness. See, God's goal is not merely that the church would hear the word, but that we would act on what we hear being preached. Matthew 28, 18, and he says, and, he, and Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me under heaven and earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you, even to the end of the age. This is the great commission that we would go and baptize, teaching them to observe. And that word observe does not just mean teaching them to hear, but to undergo. To undergo the process of discipleship through obedience to the word of God. To whatever degree you're at. See, I'm a pastor. So what God requires from me, it, it's, it's no longer about smoking cigarettes or drinking a beer. Now it's about the motives and intents of my heart. Even in serving Him, God wants me to check my motives. Are you up here this morning because you want to preach Jesus or because you want people to be impressed with what you're saying? Are you up here this morning out of obligation or do you really desire to worship the living God? Are you up here this morning to bring glory to the name of Jesus or bring glory to yourself? See, these are the things that nobody outside of me will ever know and even I won't know unless I put my, undergo the process, process of examining myself before the Holy Spirit. See, there's power in obedience. And that's this morning what my message is about, is the power that comes in obedience. The first thing that we see in, in obedience is that the pow there's a power of freedom. Living in obedience to God keeps our relationship with God open and free. There's a power and there's a freeing power. Miserable Christians are the ones who are double-minded. They, like, they, they, like Matthew 11 says, Come to me, all you who are heavy laden. And I will give you rest. Take upon me my yoke and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. See, serving Jesus becomes an easy yoke when you're obedient. The yoke only gets heavy when we resist the direction God has for us. What a yoke is, is back in the day when they, they would farm, they would have animals, two ox. And the ox would tread the field. They would tread the field. And what they would put, they would put an older ox who was already learned, already broken and knew what to do. And they would take an, a younger ox and they would take a piece of wood, a piece of wood like these railroad tie kind of things, and they would notch out on them too. And they would put it on their neck and they would put a chain so they were yoked together. 
And as they were yoked together, the older ox would show the younger ox. The younger ox would want to pull his own way, but they were yoked together. So, so the younger ox couldn't do what he wanted to do. But the reality of the situation is the younger ox was learning to be yoked to the older ox, but the older ox was carrying more of the yoke because he was taller. Because he was taller, majority of the weight weighed on the older ox. So Jesus says, take upon you my yoke. Take upon, come under my yoke, come under my teaching. And when you're, when you're, 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 you know, your AD, spiritual ADHD wants you to pull other way, my yoke will keep you. And don't worry, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Because it's the yoke that he carries for us. But we still have to, sir, we have to understand that in that way, we have a freedom. The freedom we have when we're living obedient to the, before the Lord, it brings freedom in every arena of our life. We walk in confidence into the unknown because we know that he is with us. That's what it means. man. When I'm in obedience to God and, and I know that, that, that I'm, I'm, I'm bringing my heart before him and, 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 I'm, and, I'm being, and I'm being obedient in the things that he's calling me to do, I walk with the confidence. I walk with assurance. Because I know that, that no matter where he leads me, he's at. I know that no matter where door he leads, behind that door he is. Even if death is the door that he leads me to, he's on the other side. So I don't know what's on the other side of a lot of doors of my life. But I know if he's on the other side, because I'm walking in obedience, I have a freedom to know that he'll never leave me nor forsake me. That he, would, that he who began a good work is faithful and just to complete it. I know that he will never give me more than I can handle. These are promises that I'm living in because I'm walking in the freedom that comes in walking in obedience. The confidence, it allows me to stand firmly on the promises of God with full assurance. I'm not gambling, hoping that my sin won't catch up with me. You ever gone to the ATM, you put it in, and it's almost like playing the slots because you don't know if anything's going to come out or not. You have no assurance. You're not sure. You ever done that? You're like, man, I don't know. Did that bill hit? Did this bill hit? I don't know. Let's go. Come on, 7 or 11. You know, we play that game. And sometimes we do that with the Lord. We, we feel the Lord telling us to do something, and we start to do it, but we're like, yeah, but do, I don't have the full assurance because I don't have the confidence that comes with knowing that he's with me because there's sin hidden lying, or I'm not sure if, if I'm going to be found out, or I'm not sure if this is going to catch up with me, and there's no freedom. There's no freedom. You know, I got a problem, man, I want to pray for them, but who am I to pray? I'm this, I'm that, I'm this. Don't you think, don't you think God wants us to walk in freedom? Like in my relationships, like if I'm doing, like if I, I remember when I was in the world, people are always doing something behind your back. So when you see them, you don't really know if they know or they don't know. So you're like, hey, and you're hugging them, but really you're searching to see if they know or you're looking at them like, hey, does this guy know? Does this guy know? This guy don't know? Okay, and even you're like, he's like, come with me to the store. You're like, oh, I don't know. Do I go? You're unsure because there's no freedom in your relationship because there's hidden things. See, when we're walking in disobedience to God, the problem is that nothing's hidden from his eyes. But we, but we, we have no confidence. See, the confidence, it allows me to stand firm on his promises. Proverbs chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. It says, whoever loves instructions loves knowledge, but he who hates correction is stupid. A good man obtains favor from the Lord, but a wicked intentions he will condemn. A man is not established by wickedness, but the root of righteousness cannot be moved. I mean, that idea, that idea, but he who hates correction, you know, like I said before, like I think you're great, but the Bible says if you don't like correction, you're stupid. That's what the Bible says. I don't think you're stupid. You know what I mean? You know, and I think you're great. I think you're wonderful. But what the Word of God says is this, that if you don't like correction, you're stupid. That's what it says. I didn't make it up. It's mean. It might hurt your feelings. But hey, guess what? I didn't say it. You know what I mean? He said it. <laughs> Hello. And so we have to see that it's in our right. It's, our, it's, it's that God, he, he, he will establish us as we walk in obedience to him. So you, have to, you and I, we have to recognize the spiritual truth that we are new creations. That is a new design. Not like the old design, but in the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. And until you have that truth revealed in you by undergoing it, you will struggle between two opinions. You know, we, we don't want to be obedient. A lot of times, nobody, nobody's disobedient because they want to be disobedient to God. That's the reality. Nobody goes, you know what, what does God want me to do? Well, I'm going to do the opposite because I just want to show God. No, nobody does that. For the most part, nobody does that. So then what, why are we disobedient? Why, why, why? Because, well, majority of the time, it's out of fear. Fear, you're scared. Because obedience is going to require you to let go of something that you're used to, something that you found confidence in, 
something that has brought about, there's something that you can control, something that you can understand. And to be obedient to God is to let those things go. And there is a fear associated with that. There is. It's, it's, it, it makes sense. God is going to ask you to step in a direction that you don't know. Let me he even said, I'm going to show you a way that you don't know. He says it in Joshua, that you don't know this way. You've never gone this way before. And so you have to let go. And that, that is a fearful thing. But, it, but, but guess what? Whether it's fearful or not, God still requires it. That's where faith comes in. Or maybe it's not fear. Maybe it's, maybe it's you know, well, most of the time it is fear. It's fear. And the Bible says that God did not give us a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and of a sound mind. He didn't give us that. That's how, come. like, man, it's like we, we have to learn. We have to recognize that spiritual truth. You have to recognize you are a new creation. I understand. Yeah, but I used to do it like this, and I used to do it like that. I understand that. But you're not that guy anymore. Look at, I used to have a, I used to have a truck. It looked a lot like this truck that I got now, but it's a, it's a gas truck. This one's a diesel. If I put gas in the diesel, guess what's going to happen? My, I'm going to ruin my truck. But I'm used to putting gas. I don't know about It's like, yes, but in order to do the new thing, the new way, you have to let go of the old thing and the old way. And you and I, we have to understand that the freedom that we can have in the Lord only comes when we're not between two opinions. See, I encourage you to embrace that new identity in Christ and to kill that old man. See, the world believes the lie that doing whatever you want is freedom, only to find out you become a slave to sin. When we were a teenager, you know, when I was a teenager, um, I remember seeing my friends that their parents would let them do whatever they wanted. And I'd be like, man, they're so lucky. You know, they're so lucky. Hey, mom, can I go spend the night over there? My parents would know. They'd be like, you ain't spending the night over there. Why? Come on. Their, their parents are there. Yeah, but their parents let them do whatever they want. Man, look it. And they're like, can you come over? He'd be like, I can't come over, man, because my parents know your parents let us do whatever we want. And they'd be like, man, I'd be like, man, they're so lucky. Only to grow up and you see where those people end up. They're not so lucky. Because that, that, that worldly freedom leads to slavery. It leads to bondage. You become enslaved to sin. And you go, I'm free, I'm free, I'm free. No, you're not. You're a slave to sin. I could quit any time. I could do, really? No, nah, it's not how it works. I've quit 15 times. Well, if you really quit, then you wouldn't be going back, you know? And so that, it deceives us. That, that worldly mentality deceives us. See, because the devil tries to use deception to rob us of our freedom in Christ. He tries to deceive us with our emotions. It's true, you know, the devil, he runs game. He runs game on our minds. And in making you believe that an emotion, if you feel this way, then you should act this way. Instead of standing on the promises of God. We must all be submitted to the Holy Spirit and obedient to the Word of God. And if you don't read the Word, you're going to become an emotional Christian because you think every emotion is the Holy Spirit. And you make your own soul the Lord of your life and not Jesus of the Bible. What I mean by that is your soul is your intellect, your will, and your emotion. That's your soul. And our soul is to be subject to the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? It means that when I feel one way, then I have to see, I have to run it through the Scriptures. Because if I don't, but if I don't know the Scriptures then I'm going to be subject to my soul because I have no authority to stand on. So when I, when I don't read my word, when I'm not in the scriptures, when I'm not allowing the Holy Spirit to give me understanding of his word and I'm not spending in the time in the presence of the Lord, then I start praising the Lord with my lips, but my soul is what guides me. And so I call everything Jesus. I, feel, I don't feel like going to church today. The Lord's telling me not to go to church today. I feel like going to this church. The Lord's telling me to go to this church. You know what? They're telling me I, that, that I ain't right, that I need to get right. I'm going to go to this. The Lord's leading me here. The Lord's leading me here. The Lord's leading me here. The Lord's. And at the end of the day, your testimony is full of confusion, and you make a God that never changes into a God of confusion. God has not given us a spirit of confusion. That's what the Bible says. See, that's what we have to see. There's a, I'm going to tell you what. I am not a good person. When I feel a lot of crazy things, if you guys could see into my mind, you would be like, what the heck? Hey, Pastor, you know what I mean? Because I'm a man just like every other man. But see, what happens is my mind will go one way and I'll get over here. What? That's not what the Bible says. Get over here. That's not what the Bible says. It's, it's, the Bible says, gird up the loins of your mind. Oh, it's okay. Gird up the loins of your mind. What that means is like, this shirt's a little long. A lot of shirts are for me. And... They used to wear robes, and when they would wear robes, they would go and they would just live their life with the robes, and it was no problem. But when a man went out to go to war or he went to go to work, 
If he was letting his robe hang like nothing and he went and say war and, and something caught his robe, it could snag and it could limit his movement and, it was, and he could die. Or if he was working, it would limit his ability to work. So what they do is they called it girding where they would have a belt around the robe and when they were going to go to work or to go to war, they would take the loose ends and they would flap them in. And then they would take the back and they would pull the back up and they would stick stick it under their belt so that their loins were girded so now they could maneuver in a way that was nimble it made them able to move quickly because now at that point they were if you saw a man girded you know he was going to work or he was going to war men didn't walk around girded just to be girded they but see you and i were called to gird the loins of our mind to take in all that loose thinking, all those ideas and opinions that are not in tune with God's Holy Spirit. We take those, those, those loose ends, we gird them. And what is the belt in the armor of God? The belt of truth, of God's truth, not my truth. I have a lot of opinions. I have a lot of political opinions. I have a lot of ideas. I have a lot of feelings. But guess what? All of those feelings, because I'm a man who's ready to work and a man ready to go to war, I take all of those feelings, I gird them, and I stick them in God's truth. And they're the ones. They don't have say. They can't. I'm not going to allow that loose thinking. Because see, if I go to war and I'm thinking loosely and I'm thinking sloppily, then that's going to get tangled up and that's going to enable the enemy to take advantage of me. But because I take serious my work and my war, I'm going to gird the loins of my mind because I know that he's out there. He's like a lion seeking whom he may devour. And who he devours are the weak or the sick. And I'm not going to be one of them. I will gird up the loins of my mind in God's truth so that I could wage war, an effective and an efficient war against the enemy. Because if he's going to take me out, it ain't going to be because I was being sloppy. He ain't going to. And because of that, he ain't going to be able to take me out. That's what the Bible yeah. says. He isn't going to be able to. And you go, well, that's a bold statement. I don't care. All I got to do is resist the devil. I stand in victory because I am covered by the blood. I don't have to worry about him. I don't. I don't have to worry about him. And two, because, because I, I walk in obedience. And like I say, I don't want this to sound like I walk in perfection. I mess up on a daily. It's like it's. It's a constant thing, but I pick myself and put myself back in obedience to God. And so, you know, when I say obedience, I'm not talking about perfection. I'm talking about in submission to the Holy Spirit. That's obedience and what he requires of us. So we must be so obedient because he's going to try to steal the freedom by overthinking it too. Instead of being an instant obedience, we lawyer it up. You know, we, we, we try to lawyer our way out of obeying God's word. Remember the disciples, he says, he says, what is the greatest commandment? He says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your spirit, with all of your strength, with everything, and lo love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, well, Lord, let me ask you a question. Who's my neighbor? Right? Who's my neighbor? Because my neighbor right here, he's cool, but that other one right there, I can't stand that fool. But he's not really my neighbor, right? Who's my neighbor? We start lawyering it up, right? We hear a word like this, we leave like, man, tomorrow, I'll tell you what, I'm about to win souls for the kingdom. You wake up, be like, I mean, what? I mean, what does it really mean to win souls? Like, I mean, come on. Like, what if I just, we start finding ways to compromise our way out of the commitment that we made. And what we need to do is have instant obedience. Instant obedience. As soon as you hear a word, as soon as you hear a word, you need to find any opportunity to, to water that word, to look for an, an opportunity to be instantly obedient to that word to let, so that it can take root in your heart. Take root in your heart. The next thing that we see when it comes to obedience and the power of obedience is that the power of obedience, it brings a peace. Knowing that obedience is pleasing to God, it brings a peace. You don't have to constantly be making excuses for disobedience, lying only to yourself, and even that doesn't work. So you're walking around acting weird because you think everybody knows that you're not obeying God and are in sin. Nobody knows, you know what I mean? But you think, and, it, and, and, and it's like one of those things, you don't have any peace. There's no peace. You want to, I mean, geez, there's nothing better than being able to just with a, in spirit and in truth, lift your hands and praise the Lord. There's, there's like nothing really like it. There's nothing, that freedom. It's just like, man, Lord, at that moment, you honestly could say, Lord, you could take me right now and I'll be good with it. That, and that's an honest, it's an honest thing you feel. But it comes when we have the peace of God, the peace of God that comes. It's knowing I'm at peace. You lay your head down at night and you go, you know what, Lord? Man, if you don't, if you take me tonight, I'm man, you know what? I'm at peace with it because I'm at peace with you. When we don't want to be obedient, one of the signs is that we always want to, we always want to give other people the power as to why we're not obedient. Why don't you tell them anything? So the reality is if I tell them something, you're going to get right. They have more power over you than you do. 
It's an excuse. The reality of the situation is if you don't have peace in your heart, it's not really an external thing. That's why Jesus, that's why the word God, that the God would give you his peace, which surpasses understanding. You know what that means? It means that when you have the peace of God, it doesn't mean that you have every answer and every solution. Because it's beyond understanding. Man, what's going to happen? We got this happening. We got that happening. And when you're in obedience to God, you have peace. Why? Because it doesn't, it's, I'd rather have peace than understanding. Peace, it allows me to walk in the midst of a circumstance with the peace of God. I don't have to make excuses. I don't have to lay my head down at night and make excuses as to that day I lived. I'm at peace. I can just enjoy the presence of God because in the presence of God is fullness of life. I can just enjoy it. I can enjoy it knowing that I'm covered by the blood and I'm in obedience to God. Peace with others because, you have, because you're now confident in your relationship with God and you want to help others in their walk with God. Titus 1.15 says, To the pure all things are pure, but to those who are corrupt and do not believe nothing is pure. So when we are in obedience to God, that peace, it, 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 when, I, when I see you, when I'm at peace with God and I see you, I rejoice and I want to see God, I want to see you have the peace of God. I want, I want, want to be a part, because we were, I was talking to somebody and they were asking, you know, you, you plan out your like life goals and it's this thing like, what would you do if money wasn't an issue? And it's like, what do you mean? Because money isn't always an issue. Amen? So it's like, it's like, what would you do if sin was an issue? It's like, well, sin's always been an issue, so I don't really know you. But if you ask yourself, what would you do if money wasn't an issue? And I started meditating on that because I didn't want to just throw out an answer like, you know, like just not thinking about it. I said, you know what I would want to do? I would want to help other people make money not an issue. You know? And I thought about it. I was like, man, like when you're in peace with God, you, 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 don't, you look at other people and you, you, you see them through the lenses of peace. You want to see them in peace. You know, you, you want to help them. But when you're in sin, you start looking and people rejoice. Like, yeah, all of a sudden, you're righteous. All of a sudden, you're the one. All the, you know, everything is everything. You view everything through those lenses and there's no peace. See, the peace of God has come through his son, Jesus. He died on the cross for our sins. So that we, because what separated us from God was our sin. That's why even in the temple, they would have the holiest of holies. In the, and that's where the, the Ark of the Covenant was. And between the Ark of the Covenant and man was a thick veil that represented sin. So nobody could go into the holiest of holies because sin separated us. When Christ gave up his life on the cross at Calvary, he said, it's finished. He gave up his spirit. And the Bible says that the veil was torn from the top to the bottom. And what that represented from the top to the bottom was that God tore the veil. As if he couldn't wait another minute to be in the presence of his creation, he tore the veil because now that sin offering had been made in the blood of Jesus and now we are reconciled to him. And so, and so when we're obedient, when, when we, we experience that peace, it's, the Bible calls us ministers of reconciliation. That's what it means. It means, like, because I've been reconciled to God, now as an evangelist, the Bible says do the work of an evangelist, the work of an evangelist isn't just to preach the message, but the work of it is to preach the message and reconcile people to God. It's like, I'm not saying follow me or become a member of Living Word and your life's going to... I'm saying that I am a testimony of the, of the reconciliation by the blood of Jesus. And can I tell you, he'll reconcile you to him too. And let me tell you, this is what I did. It's like a testimony. It's like... It's like, um, it's like Jenny Craig, you know, they come out and they come out and they go like this, boom, you know, and there's no greater testimony than a transformed life. You could be like, well, eat this, eat that. I'm like, ah, oh, what's that mean? And then they show the picture and they're, they're like this. They have two people standing and wear a pair of pants, you know, and you're like, I want that. You know what I mean? You, I want to be like that. It's, there's nothing stronger than a living testimony. And so we're a living testimony of the reconciliation. Because we've been reconciled to God, now we can be reconciled to one another. Not just, in, not just to strangers, but to my family. To my family, who some of them, you know, well, not really with mine, but there's people that, you know, you don't want to be reconciled to. That there is no reconciliation. But if Christ can reconcile us to God, and we were sinners, dead in our sin, then we can be reconciled to our brothers and sisters. We can be reconciled to one another. We become record. That's that peace. That peace manifests itself in the relationships that we have with other people. That's why you can walk out and hug people that you know talked about you. Or you just hug them. Why? Because, you know, because praise God, I love you. Why? Because Jesus loves me. You know what I mean? You know, but they said this. Oh, I don't care. You know what I've done to Jesus? I've done much worse to Jesus and he forgave me so I can forgive them. And he's cast my sins into the deepest ocean. 
And now I can cast their sins into the deepest ocean. Whereas one day I wanted to cast them into the deepest ocean. Now I can cast their sins because, because Christ has reconciled me to himself. Now I can be reconciled to one another. That's peace. That's what freedom comes in obedience to God. Lastly is provision. God's provision for service to him is active to those who obey. God will rare, rarely, if ever, call us to act in a way that is in our comfort zone. It's only by faith when you, do, when you don't have all the answers. That's when it's faith. But when you're obedient, you see God move on your behalf and you grow in faith and God receives the glory. See, being obedient challenges us to go beyond our understanding, beyond our ability. And we at, we're asked to do things that are beyond our own ability to do things that we don't consider comfortable. Hebrews 11.8 says, By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out of the place which he would receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. The provision of God is found in, the, in obedience. Do you want God? Do you, I want God to renew my life. Then I have to be obedient. When I was um, like 25, that P90X came out. Remember P90X? Do you remember that? That workout program? And uh, I'm going to confess my sins. My friend bootleg, bootlegged the whole thing for me. And he bootlegged the, the whole, everything. And so you see these guys, and man, they get, they get like ripped. They look like pit bulls, you know? And I started to do it, and I started realizing, geez, man, I bet you this could get me in shape, but it was no joke. It was hard. It was not easy to do. And so when we step out in faith, it challenges our abilities. It challenges it. It brings us out of our comfort zone. And you go, well, I don't know. How is that going to happen? It's like, well, when you... See, the this is the problem the world has. The problem says the world has is that the world will say, show me and I will believe. God says, believe and I will show you. God will never move until you move in faith. Faith is the substance that God uses to produce. You have to give God something in order for God to move. God just doesn't move because you want him to move. God says, go here and I will bless you. Bless me and I'll go there. He says, no, you don't understand. You have to give me something to work with. Give me your faith. Give me the hope that you have in my word, that faith, and I will in turn produce my, my promise in your life. But it will never happen in the reverse. It will never be, he'll show you and then you do it. It's going to be, do it and then he'll show you. That's what faith is. All of Hebrews chapter 11, you read of faith, followed by obedience that led to the fulfillment of the promises of God. And not one of these people are perfect, or even close to perfect, but one thing they were was obedient when God spoke to them. See, perfection is not required to do God's will, but obedience is required. Salvation is free. I want to get that clear. Today, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, it is a free gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I'm not saying that you gotta, you got to strive for this perfection in order to be saved. The Bible says that if you believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins, that he gave his life and, and rose again on the third day, that you can be saved, you shall be saved. You can never be, I'm no more, I'm a pastor who's been serving God for 20 years. I'm no more saved today than I was that day that I gave my life to Jesus 20 years ago. Salvation is a free gift of God, but the purpose and the promise of God will cost you your life. That's the reality. Salvation is a free gift by faith in the risen Son of God. That, that you're a sinner who's dead in your sins and that Christ came down. He's God in the form of a man. He lived a sinless life and died in your place. That to him who believes, it says with a mouth, with a mouth confession is made, but with the heart one believes. If you believe that and you place your faith in Christ, you can be saved. But in order to go from salvation to the promises... It requires our obedience because the Bible says that once you are saved, you become a new creation. And the old things have passed away, so the old ways that you were satisfied, the old ways that you were fulfilled, the old ways that you sought affirmment, the old ways that you sought your identity, the old ways that you found peace, those are all dead and you are now a new creation in Christ. And now everything that you need for life is found in Him. That's where obedience comes in. Because we experience the God, we experience the power of God to the degree in which we're willing to be obedient to God. Abraham, I, watched, I remember reading the story of Abraham for the first time in Genesis and being like, dang, man, it's kind of jacked up how much God put this man through. It was like, 
you're going to be the father of many nations. You're going to be father of many nations. And it was just like trial after trial after trial. trial. And then you get the promise, and now you're the father. Here he is, the son, Isaac. And Okay, now this is what I want you. I want to take Isaac up on the hill and sacrifice him. It's like, geez, right when you think this, you know, it's like right when you think the ending happens, uh, the sequel happens. You know, now you got to, now it's, a, and it's like, why, Lord, why? The reason why Abraham went through that, because he was going to be the father of faith to all. He was going to be a testimony of faith all of creation through this man. And so you go, man, like, that kind of calling requires that level of testing, that development of character. And so the degree in which we are willing to be obedient is the degree in which we will experience the promises of God. Some, I'm going to be honest, and it's a sad, it's a sad statement, but it's the reality. Some people are going to get up to heaven, they're going to spend eternity with God, and they're going to be like, they're going to think that they're going to get judged as a car dealer, and God's going to judge them as a pastor. Well, Lord, I never pastored a church. Yeah, but I called you to called you to the work of an evangelist. I called you to the work of a missionary. But Lord, I want to be judged as an employee who, who did 20 years and, and, you know, and lived uh, you know, a pretty seemingly uh, normal life. Well, that's not who I called you to be. I called you to be a missionary to the nations. Well, how could you judge me that? Because that's where my grace was. Well, how come I didn't experience that? Because you didn't, weren't willing to be obedient to the degree that I would have led you to that. See, like, I look where I'm at now in Paris, and uh, Bobby, Bobby 20 years ago would have never stepped into the church in Buena Park if I would have known, if I would have just seen a snapshot of work, I would have been so scared. I would have been so scared, I would have been like, wait, what? Oh, heck no, and I would have dodged. But God has tutored me through time to bring me to this place of faith. He has grown me, and I'm not, I, I, you know, I am not uh, the model of obedience, perfect obedience. But one thing I do do, like Paul said, I let go of the things behind, and I press forward to the things Ahead, I, I, I press towards the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Amen? And that's what we have to do. We have to strive for obedience to the degree where we're at. See, God may not be calling you to leave your job to go be a missionary in Indonesia. That might not be your calling right now. But God is calling you to some level of obedience. You need to respond. Either you go forward or you regress backwards. But there is no standing still. You have to go out of your comfort zone. Into the, but can I tell you, when you step into obedience, you will always have God's peace, God's provision, and you will always have the freedom when you desire to be obedient. There's always grace for obedience. That's what I've always learned. When things are, even when it's hard, it's like, yeah, but there's still a level of grace. There's still an unmerited favor that will allow me to do what that which I'm not comfortable doing because God is faithful. So this morning, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you, man, that whatever it is, whatever the degree that God is requiring you to be obedient, be obedient. Don't rob God of his right to bring glory to his name through your life by being disobedient to his calling because you're afraid to step into the unknown by faith. Learn to develop a, a, a willingness to be obedient. It doesn't require, the Bible says a, even a must, if you had even a mustard seed of faith, you could say to this mountain, be cast in the sea and it'll be cast. It doesn't require much. I'm not asking you to be the perfect Christian. I'm not asking you to preach a message tomorrow. I'm asking you to search your heart and ask where God is requiring of you a level of obedience and wrestle with God and don't leave that place until your answer is, yes, Lord, what would you have me do? Yes, Lord, stay in that place. Stay in that place until you hear from God, until he tells you. And like Jacob said, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. What he was saying was, do you change me? I've been a conniver. I've been a schemer. I'm not going to let you go. Let me go the daybreak. I'm not going to let you go until you change me. I'm tired of being this way. I want to be what you called me to be. We have to look for that opportunity at every point. And like I said, it doesn't, I don't know where you're at. People go, well, Pastor, what do I do next? I don't know. It's not for me to know. It's between you and God. It's in that garden of your soul where you walk with God. And it's just you two. Sarah can't tell me what to do when it, in regards to God's will for my life. It's between me and God. Even as her pastor, as your pastor, I can't tell you exactly what you need to do. I can give you, I can give you encouragement on what to do to get the answer from God, but you have to get your own answer from God. You have to get your own provision, your own word from Him in order, what's the next step? What's the next step? I don't know. I could pray for you. I could pray with you. I could believe with you. I can give you some instruction. I can give you some guidance according to the word of God. But at the end of the day, if you don't hear that word directly from Him, it will not be strong enough to keep you going forward. It has to be that kind of word, that word that, that, that speaks into the inner part of you that nobody else can speak to. And that word is at a cost. But when response to that word needs to be, yes, Lord, 
Yes, obedience to him. Full obedience. You'll never regret it. I'm 20 years into this, and I, I, my worst day in the Lord is better than my best day in the world. Because to know God and the power of his resurrection, there's nothing like it. I know every good thing that I have comes from him, and I can rejoice in him. And I look back, and, and I go, man, God, why? And it's just... And he goes, and I look back and it's just like little acts of obedience that led to these places where I'm just so full of gratitude for his provision in my life. So today, man, let's bow our head, let's close our eyes, let's go before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you today, Lord, and we thank you, Lord God, for your Holy Spirit It's in this place. We know your word says where two or more are gathered, and there you are in the midst, Father. We feel, we sense your Holy Spirit moving in us, Lord. Father, today, Lord God, I pray, Father, a renewed commitment of our lives to be obedient to you, Lord. We've compromised at points where we become content with being half obedient. And half obedient is still disobedience. Help us, Lord. Help us, Father God, to develop convictions that are so strong that we fear you to go against them. Help us, Lord God, to discern the, to be able to cultivate the ability to walk in obedience to you. Help it to be a priority of our life, Lord God to be pleasing to you, to respond to your blessing and to your faithfulness through obedience. Lord, we thank you today, Lord. Today we renounce our sin, Father God. We, we turn away from it right now, God. We lay it at your feet, Lord God. And we, we commit to you, Lord God, today, Father, to be obedient, Lord God. Your word says you'll never give us more than we can handle. So, Father, I pray, challenge us. Challenge us, Lord God. Let this be a new season of growth, Lord, as we seek to be obedient to you. That we would not count the opinions of anybody else or anything else equal to you, Lord God. You stand alone. Your truth is eternal. It never changes. It always is and always will be the truth. So, Lord, we thank you today, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, that we can, we can be renewed in your presence. We thank you today, Lord God, for another opportunity to repent and place our faith fully in you again, Lord God. We thank you today, Lord, for ministering to us through your word, Lord. And today, Father God, if there be anybody in this place who does not know you, Lord, I pray your, that you would reveal yourself, show yourself, that your Holy Spirit would make its home in whoever does not know you, whoever hears this word, Lord, that you would make, in them, make them a new creation in the image of your Son, Jesus that you would give them eternal life, that you would write their name in the Lamb's book of life, Lord God, and that your spirit would begin to give them understanding, Father. Lord, as they repent of their sins and place their faith in you, Lord, we thank you, Lord God. You are so worthy of praise. You are so worthy to be glorified, to be magnified, Lord, be enthroned in our hearts, Lord. Truly, truly, Lord God, be the Lord of our life, Lord. Be the Lord of our life. Rule in us. Reign in us. Let your will be done in us and through us. Father, we thank you today, Lord God. We thank you. We give you all the honor, glory, and praise. In Jesus' name, we agree by saying.